Okay, guys, uh, it's time for us to start. We are now starting a new topic in the uh, work, chapter two of the work, and that's complex analysis. So, uh, we just take a break from the Fourier series for the time being. We'll come back to the Fourier methods later on. It turns out uh, with the Fourier methods, uh, so far we've dealt with rods and so on of finite length, things that are small. Uh, the length you know, is manageable. But later on, the length will be regarded as infinite, in which case you will have to work out integrals from minus infinity to plus infinity, and some hectic integrals will be worked out. But fortunately, it turns out that there's a beautiful theorem due to Augustine Louis Cauchy, which can actually help to solve those integrals. And you wouldn't believe it. You'll be able to do integration without doing integration. In other words, if you can only remember how to do differentiation, you'll get away. Cauchy's integral theorem is regarded as one of the most beautiful pieces of mathematics you know, in all history. And uh, we'll prove the theorem as we go along. But before we get there, we must lay the groundwork for complex analysis by looking at all the basic facts. So let's start off from where you would be comfortable with. Let's start with a complex number. So uh, can you recap what is a complex number? How do you characterize a complex number? Complex number has the form z equals to x plus i y. Okay, it's made up of two parts, and i is the square root of minus 1. You can also plot a complex number on the coordinate plane. So the complex number has a certain specific place on the plane, some x and y values. So the complex number can also be associated with some angle there and some radius. For example, if you take the complex number 1 minus i, this number is actually 1 minus 1 i. So x is 1, y is minus 1. So actually, this number can be plotted with the number 1 minus 1. So if you plot on the coordinate plane 1 minus i, it will just be a dot at 1, x is 1, y is minus 1. So then that dot represents the position of the complex number as it were. But this number is characterized by two elements, the x, x value and the y value. So uh, in this case, what will the angle be? You can consider the angle to be minus pi over 4. And the radius will be root 2. 1 squared plus 1 squared is 2, and the square root of that. You can also go with the angle with all the Five four. But generally, we try to keep it small. It's easier, more convenient to work with minus 5 or 4. And each complex number has a unique spot on the coordinate plane. Even though a complex number might go around many times and end up in the same spot, it is characterized by a unique uh, number, set of numbers. Okay, so you recall, what, what do we mean by mod z? Before that? It's the length or the magnitude of the complex number. It's a square root of x squared plus y squared. What do we mean by bar z? Z is x plus i y. What do you recall about bar z? X minus i y. And what do you call it? The word for that? The conjugate. The conjugate. So the conjugate of 2 plus 3i is 2 minus 3i, and vice versa. So you'll find that the uh, magnitude of z is the same as z, z bar. If you take z, z times z bar is x plus i y times x minus i y. Multiply it out x squared plus xyi minus xyi, then it's minus i squared y squared. These two die off, and so you get x squared 
Of course, you know I squared is minus 1. So minus I squared is plus 1. Okay, so that's the, the basic idea there. Then, how do you add and subtract complex numbers and divide them? To add them, straightforward, if you want to add x plus i y to a plus b i, you merely add the real components and the complex of the unreal components, imaginary components. So this part is the real part, and this part is the imaginary part. You add the two co components, so you get x plus a plus y plus b i. And likewise, subtraction is the same kind of thing. We've dealt, done uh, multiplication. Let's just uh, go forward to division. Suppose you want to divide uh, 2 plus 3i by 4 minus 7i. The beautiful thing about complex numbers is that you can always, it doesn't matter how much of heavy lifting and have, you know, hectic work that you end up doing, complex number will always come back to the form x plus i, y. It's quite amazing. You can't destroy it. You raise it to a power of a thousand. You'll find things will cancel and so on. Eventually, you'll come back to the form x plus i, y. That's quite incredible. So suppose I want to write this in shape x plus i, y. At the moment, it's not. So then, if you recall, the technique here is to multiply the numerator and denominator by the conjugate of the denominator. It's what we call rationalizing. In high school, you have rationalizing the denominator. Here is making the denominator a real number. So the, if you multiply by 4 plus 7i, 4 plus 7i, that's legal. You can multiply by the same thing, top and bottom. On the top, you'll get 4 twos are 8, plus uh, 12i, plus 14i, 7 3 is a 21 i squared, so it's minus 21. At the bottom, it's a number and it's conjugate, so it'll be a squared plus b squared. 16 plus 49. Some difference, it'll be a difference of two squares, but with the i squared, it's minus 1. So the difference of two squares will become a sum of two squares. So effectively, you've got 8 minus 21 is minus 13 plus 26 i. Uh, what's 49 plus 16? 65. So there you go. It's in that shape. X plus I, Y. And that number can be plotted on the coordinate plane. Now, there are some different representations of complex numbers. form I gave you so far, z equals to x plus i, y, is a popular form. As I said, it generates a, an angle and a radius. So that's y, x. It generates an angle there and a radius. The radius, of course, is the square root of x squared plus y squared. It's a standard Pythagoras theorem. The angle is arc tan of y over x. Right. So x plus i y, if you perform this very sinister disguise, where you multiply the outside by the root of x squared plus y squared, and inside you divide by the square root of x squared plus y squared, i y over root of x squared plus y squared. Now you're wondering what's going on. Why is he doing such a sinister move there? Doesn't seem to be useful. But you can see there's nothing really happening. You cancel these off, it comes back to x, cancel those off, it comes back to y. But why I'm doing that weird maneuver is to show you that this in front is r. In the brackets, you've got x over root x squared plus y squared. In other words, x over r, that's cos theta, plus i. y over root x squared plus y squared is sine theta. So you can write the complex number in the shape r cos theta plus i sine theta. And it's quite common to say writing time, to write it as 
CIS or size theta. Instead of writing it many times, people abbreviate it. And then Euler discovered a, fa a famous theorem, Euler's theorem. E to the i theta equals to cos theta plus i sine theta. That's a famous Euler's theorem. How do you prove the theorem? How do you know it's true? Anyone think of a method of proving this? You can use mathematical induction, which you may have done in Math 130, Math in first year. And then, of course, we can use a series expansion. You can expand e to the i theta. And you can expand cos theta. It has a series expansion. Even sine theta has a series expansion. And when you add the two up on both sides, you see the series are the same. You know cosine generates even terms, sine generates odd terms. x minus x cubed over 3 plus x to 5 over 5, 5 factorial over blah, blah, blah. This one will be uh, x squared over 2 factorial, x to the 4th over 4 factorial plus minus. And you put them together, you will get the series for the exponential series, which is x to the k over k factorial. So that confirms that they are the same. Uh, of course, if you invoke the radius r, z equals r e to the i theta, you can get r cos theta plus i sine theta, which then leads me to the another, another important result in first year math, that is Damois's theorem. You recall Damois's theorem? If you raise both sides to the power n, z to the power n, you'll get r to the n, e to the i, n theta, or you can have r to the n there, cos n theta plus i sine n theta. So incredibly, the exponent n finishes up here, cos n theta. Again, one can prove that with mathematical induction. I hope the first year lectures did that. It's quite an exciting proof to see. Mathematical induction, you know how that works? They're climbing a ladder. Firstly, you show it's true for n equals to 1. On the left hand side and right hand side are the same. Then you assume it's true for some n equals to k. Like you've got a long ladder, it's infinitely long. Assume you can climb to some level. Now show from that level you can climb to the next level, n plus 1 level. Or k plus 1 level. So if you can do that, and that applies to the whole ladder, it means you can climb every step in the ladder. That's really mathematical induction. So this is the uh, famous Euler's theorem, uh, the Morvis theorem. We're going to need this. Let, let me take one or two examples on the Morvis theorem because I think you may have forgotten. By the way, I made a video for you on the, on the web in the course website at the bottom of the page. Because last year I discovered a number of students forgot the Moabas theorem. Let's just take an example. Uh, let's take uh, 1 plus root 3i to the power of what? Give me some number. Let's be adventurous, man. Let's make it like 2018 or something. Let's take 1 plus root 3i to the power of 2018. Immediately you are gasping in your seats. What? Why didn't he take such a complicated one? So go on forever now. I hope it doesn't come out in the exam. Well, I'll show you that this can be done in a very simple way. It's not complicated at all. The first thing to, to do is to start with the number 1 plus root 3i. Okay? Remember that's x and that's y. So you plot the, the point 1 root 3 on the system of axes. 1 root 3, 1 there, root 3 there. Of course, the radius will turn out to be 2 by the theorem of Pythagoras. And what will the angle theta turn out to be? Radius will be 2. What is the angle theta? When you have a triangle with 2, 1, root 3, what is the angle here? Also root 3, so it will be Okay, if you don't know it in fire language, what is it in degrees? How many degrees? You have a 2, 1, root 3 triangle. 
Oh, you got famous triangle. In high school, you've done it. Well, oh, I see you are the calculator generation. You guys used to punch the thing in the machine and keep the examiners. The two famous triangles are the one, one, root two triangle and the one, root three and two. Opposite the root, root three is how many degrees? Another one degree. 30. 60, 30, 90. That's a 2, 1, 2, 3 triangle. So it will turn out to be theta will be pi over 3. 60 degrees. Pi is 180 degrees. However, as I said, you can go around many times and you can achieve the same position if you go around 2k pi times. Every multiple of 2 pi will bring you back to the same position. You can go around this thing millions of times. And each time you generate a new number, a different angle. If k is 0, the angle is pi over 3. If k is 1, that's 2 pi plus pi over 3. That's 2 plus 1 third. That's 7 thirds pi. 7 thirds pi is a different number altogether from 1 third pi. If you have to draw it on a number line, one third pi is about one comma some, some change. Seven third pi is like seven comma some change. So although it represents the same location, it's a different number. Okay, so then what I do now, I convert this, so, so I've got z, z to be that. Let me now take z to the power 2018. So that will be, well, z is actually, 2 cos pi over 3 plus 2k pi. Okay, sorry, it's not, let me write it nice and big, otherwise you get confused. Let me write it from here. So z is 1 plus 3i. I said it's the same as 2 into cos pi over 3 plus 2k pi, plus i sine pi over 3 plus 2k pi, all to the power, well, that, that's z. So if I take z to the power 2018 now, which is what I want, it will be 2 to the power 2018, cos of, now I must multiply 2018 into the bracket. So it's 2018 pi over 3 plus 2 times 2018, 4036k5, 4036k5. So the 2018 gets multiplied into the angle. That's the Morvis theorem. The Morvis theorem says this exponent here can multiply into the angle. This pi over 3 now is 2018 pi. Because 2k5 is 2018 times 2k5. Plus I sine, same thing, 2018 pi over 3 plus 4036k pi. And use a square bracket there. Now, this can be written as 20, uh, 2 to the power 2018. What can you say about 4036k pi? If you go around many times. A cosine of, can you remember from high school you had cos of 360 degrees plus theta? What is cos of 360 degrees plus theta? Comes back to what? Come on, right? cos 360 degrees plus theta. Cos of 360 degrees plus, let's say, 30 degrees is the same as? But what does it become? Yes, it's in the first quadrant, so? Come on, guys, you are very slack in this. You don't, you don't remember your schoolwork, man. It's a cosine 30. It remains the same. Right? The same with sine. If you take sine of 360 degrees plus 30 or plus 40 or whatever, it will come back to sine of 40. 
If you don't believe it, take your calculator out and convince yourself and you know. But it's quite the annoying if you don't know. So the model of the chain is that I can ignore this one because it'll keep on coming back to the same place. So the game can become cost of 2018 5 plus I sign 2018 5 over 3. Can you see I can ignore that other part because it comes back, it winds around. Every 2 pi comes back to the same position. And we have an even number of uh, 2 pi. An even number of 2 pi. Then it's okay. You can ignore it. If it was an odd number, then sine comes into play. Into play. The sine of pi is minus 1. Okay, anyway, let's try to complete it. So this becomes 2 to the power 2018. What is 3 goes into 2018? Cost of 3 goes into 26 times, 3 goes into 21, 7 times, 3 goes into 8, 2 times, and 2 thirds. 672 pi plus 2 third pi plus i sine 672 pi plus 2 third pi. Once again, I can trim this down. 672 pi is the even number of pi. It comes back to just that there, cos 2 third pi. Cos 2 third pi plus i sine 2 third pi. And cos 2 third pi it's like cos of 120. What is cos of 120? Cos of 60 was root 3 over 2. Uh, root 3 over 1. No. Remember we had root 3, 1, and 2 here. Yeah. This is 60. 5 over 3. Cos 60 was half. So this is going to be... This is now in the second quarter. Plus 120 is what plus or minus in the second one? Minus. It's minus half. Minus half plus. What about sine of two third pi? Which quadrant is two third pi? Second quadrant. And sine is positive. So sine of two third pi is root three over two. Pi. So that's fine. That's now the, the end of the problem. The point I, I want to make for your benefit is that this is actually a unique solution. Unique. You should write this word down because the game is going to change. For now it's unique, but uh, as we go along we'll find that the solution may not be unique. Okay, so if you forgot this, there is a video on the website I've made and you can practice. Notice how it didn't matter how big this number 2018 was, even if it was a million, yes? I divided 2018 divided by 3. 3 goes into 20, 6 times. 3 goes into 21, 7 times. 3 goes into 8, 2 times. Remainder 2 thirds. All right, now let's take a slightly different example. This time, uh, answer may not be unique. Example two. Uh, let's take make any example. So let's just take find uh, one minus i the power one quarter. Find the value one minus i to the power one quarter. When I say find, I mean in the form x plus i y. It's not in that form at the moment. We need to convert it to that form. All right, so you start off by saying z equals to 1 minus i. Then you realize that that's the point 1 minus 1. Uh, 
oh, last time I had one minus one. Let's make it minus one plus one i. So that it'll be a little different from the first example. So let's take minus one plus here. So you plot the point minus one plus one. What is the angle there? Keep in mind this is pi over four here, so how much is it on the other side? Remember they make up pi altogether. So what is the angle that's really different? The first thing you have to work out is the angle and also the radius. Radius is quite easy. It's the square root of two, okay? The angle now, take away from uh, pi minus pi over four, is three quarter pi. 135 degrees. So now let's convert this to the shape of root 2 into cos theta. So I'll tell you what I shall do now. You, you can see how it works. So we can write CIS. It covers both. Why waste our ink and my pixels here on the screen? Let's rather abbreviate it. So the angle will be 3 quarter pi plus 2k pi. So that is it. I simply converted this guy into that shape. R theta shape. If you're not getting it, just ask me to pause and repeat. I know you may have forgotten this stuff. You knew it a long time ago in first year, and then you may have not seen it in second year, but if it's not too clear and things are not working how you think they should work, then just let me know. So now let's do z to the one quarter. So it's root two to the one quarter on both sides. Now it will be CIS. You have to multiply the quarter into the angle, right? That's the marvelous theorem. Cos of n theta is sorry, something to the power n is cos of n theta. N comes into the bracket. So the quarter times three quarter pi will become three sixteenth pi plus quarter times, so of 2k pi will be k pi over 2. Remember, I have quarter times 3 quarter pi plus 2k pi. That's how you get this here. So now, uh, it's not such a neat number to work with. It's not like a special angle that you know of. If it was pi over 4, then you know it's 45 degrees. Now it's 316 of pi. <laughs> it's not a famous... It's, it, is, it is a special angle, by the way. How do I know it's a special angle? What do you mean by a special angle? Anyway, why do the school teachers call this a special angle? Pi over 4 and pi over 3, pi over 6. What's so special about that? It's because you can find the trigonometric values without a calculator. They have exact values. Like the sine of pi over 4 is 1 over root 2. That's an exact value. Calculator will say 0, 0.707, blah, blah, blah. But the exact value is 1 over root 2. So there are certain angles that are special angles, like 0, 30, 60, 45, 90. And they are multiples. Like 150 is a multiple of 30, 5 times 30. So that's a special angle also. And also, if you take half of them, if you halve them, because isn't there a formula for cos half theta? It's like a double angle formula which you use backwards. It gives you a formula for cos half theta. So any special angle, if you keep halving it, it's still a special angle. So this, this pi over 4, or 3 quarter pi, if you have it, it will be 3, 8, pi. If you have it, it will be 3, 16, pi. It is a special angle. You can find this value. It might be like a hectic thing with many square roots and stuff in it, but it can be found without a calculator. <laughs> That's why it's a special angle. In any case, uh, what I want to point out is now, let's just see, at the moment here, this is not a unique value. So if you take k equals to naught, and let's call the first one z naught, you'll get root 2 to the quarter. Oh, by the way, Root 2 to the quarter, I can 
Write him simply as 2 to the 1 eighth. Eh? So k is 0, so it'll be just cos 316 pi plus i 316 pi. It'll be some thing, some uh, number. If k equals to 1, z1 will be 2 to the 1 8 size. Now, so it's like half here. k is 1, so it's half pi. Half plus 316. What's that like? 816 plus 316. What's half plus 16? Half is 816. 8 plus 3? 1116. 1116 pi. Just double check the work with me. I don't want to make a mistake. K equals to 2. Z2 two will be equal to 2 to the 1 8th size. This time you're going to add two here. One plus three sixteen. Sixteen sixteen plus three sixteen. Nineteen sixteen. Nineteen sixteen is five. K equals to three. Z three equals to two to the one eighth. Size uh, is three over two. Three over two here. And sixteen is that. Uh, 24, 16. 24 plus 3 is 27, 16. Yeah. 27, 16. 5. Okay. K equals to 4. Z4 will be 2 to the 1 8. Size. Now this is 4. Right? That becomes 2 pi. You see what happens now? Right? It's the happy ending here. Yeah? It's 2 pi. If k is 4, that's 4 over 2, which is 2 pi. So it's 2 pi plus 316 pi. It's 316 pi, pi, sorry, plus 2 pi, which we know is the same as just 316 pi. In other words, it comes back to the start. So from here on, it loops. You get the same pattern of four recurring. Okay? So the pattern starts to loop. Therefore, there are four solutions. So, in other words, if you take the number, so that is the number minus 1 plus uh, i, the 1 quarter, as 4 roots. That's 4 roots. What's another fascinating fact about these roots? If you had to plot these roots on the coordinate plane, oh, by the way, uh, the coordinate plane here yeah, has got a special name. You call it, anyone you know, remember, it starts with A. Something diagrammatic. A, R, G. Now we should be getting it. Eh? R gang. It's an R gang diagram. R gang, A, R, G, A, N, D. R gang diagram. In love to a mathematician. So if you have to plot these dots on a coordinate plane, what do you think will happen? It's quite fascinating. If I plot the first one, it will be a length of 2, two to the 1 8 and an angle of 316 pi. So perhaps it will be there. The dot there. That's Z0. If I plot Z1, it will be there. If I plot Z2, it will be somewhere there. If I plot Z3, it will be somewhere there. So these are the four points. What can you say about these four dots? Come on, give me your gut feel. What do you think may happen? What surprise is there in this book? 
I wish I could go back and teach first year maths. You know? People don't learn anything from first year. This is another class of exam, which is absolute both. And you don't actually get exposed to the wonderful beauty of the mathematics. What happens here is that these roots arrange themselves in the shape of a square. You didn't know that. Did you realize that? The roots of the four roots of any number, in fact, not just as long as it is in the will always arrange themselves equally distant apart in terms of the uh, angle. So they must form a square if they're equally distant apart and form right angles with each other. What happens if there are five roots? Let's suppose we bring the question uh, minus one plus i to the power one fifth. Five roots of that. How will those five numbers arrange themselves? Is it shape of? This guy's going to be up until the last case now. Adventurous and we'll try and answer the questions. Why are you guys so scared? I think you have a very healthy respect about my You know that you often get a lot. You might be not saying. You need to shut up and uh, somebody else can say and make a fool of themselves. Yeah, there's some spirit of learning. Spirit of learning is you get involved with the subject and you try to pick up the ideas. It doesn't really matter if you say the wrong, say the wrong thing. In fact, when you say the wrong thing and somebody breaks it, it's more likely to speak in your head. Because you have a misconception of now it's going to break it. So if you have any root, if you have an nth root, one over n, there will be an n gone forming. It will be, if there's five roots, there will be a poly, uh, pentagon form. There will be an angle of 72 degrees between every pair of dots. It will arrange itself in the shape of a pentagon. But if it's six, the power one six, the sixth roots of this, it will be in the shape of a hexagon, a perfect hexagon. Okay, so let's leave that uh, problem there. Let's now go to uh, cover all that. Oh, good. Ah, some of the, a few notes. We're going to be studying what we call complex functions. Oh. Complex functions. Complex functions. So, uh, in other words, we can have a function like this, f of z equals to z squared. If you want to expand it, you can say x plus i y squared. Squared it out, x squared plus 2xyi. Uh, then it's going to be i squared y squared, so it'll be minus y squared. Gather the terms together, the real ones will be x squared minus y squared. The imaginary part is 2xy i. So you see it comes back to the shape uh, x plus i y. It comes back to that arrangement, x plus i y. So you can even have a complex uh, function like f of z equals to 1 over z. Same story again, you can write it as 1 over x plus i y. So z is x plus i y. Then you can hit this with the conjugate x minus i y, x minus i y. So on the top you'll have x minus i y. At the bottom, a number times this conjugate gives you x squared plus y squared. Notice I'm not asking any questions anymore because it's rhetorical all the time. So it comes back to the shape. It's something over the real number by something over the real number. All right, so that uh, now there are some theorems. Two theorems that you should be aware of. One is uh, the, what is called the fundamental theorem of algebra.
the fundamental theorem of algebra tells us an nth degree polynomial polynomial equation equation has at most n distinct roots. Distinct means that independent roots, because some roots can be equal. So then you have equal roots. Okay? Or you can factorize, you can do a factorization of a polynomial. Suppose you have a polynomial P of Z. You can factorize it as some number a n into z minus z naught to z minus z one into z minus z two dot dot dot. That's called the fundamental theorem of algebra, and it was proved by Gauss, the great mathematician Gauss, Carl Friedrich Gauss. There was another French mathematician uh, who specialized his thesis, PhD thesis was in constructing n-gons. Like, can you construct a hexagon with a ruler and compass? Do you guys know how to construct? Okay, let me start you off with the easier problem. Can you construct a triangle, an equilateral triangle with a ruler and compass? You did it in school, in grade nine. You draw a line, take a Put the compass needle here, you make an arc, place the compass needle on the other side, make another arc. Where the two meet, you join it and it's an equilateral triangle. Can you construct a square with a ruler and compass? Yes, the answer is yes. Can you do a pentagon? The answer is yes. Uh, that one is not so obvious because you have to construct a 72 degree angle. And by the way, a 72 degree angle is also a special angle. I'm not going to go into the details, but it's fascinating. One can find sine 72 without a calculator. I challenge you to find it yourself at home. It's a typical math Olympiad type problem. I don't know if you guys did well in the Olympiad, but that's what I did for many years of my life. Sine 72, cos 72, you can find it without a calculator. I challenge you guys to find it. But uh, this guy went on to construct a 19-sided polygon. That was his PhD thesis. Yeah, I'll tell you more about it later. Because we don't have much time. The second one, second theorem, remind me about the story. There's a story behind that I was building up to, but I see the clock is ticking. Complex roots always appear as conjugate pairs. Example, if 2 plus 3i is a root, so will 2 minus 3i be a root. You can't just get a polynomial equation and just have 4 plus 5i is a root. It's obvious that 4 minus 5i will be there as well. It can be proved by the prime factorization theorem. With this fundamental theorem of algebra, if there's an odd number of roots and an even number of roots, you can take two separate cases. Like if there's an even number of roots, then you can take that with a quadratic formula at some stage. And you know in the quadratic formula there's minus b plus minus root b squared minus 4ac into it. That's why those things always appear in conjugate pairs. You can't get a complex root by itself. A 2 minus root 3 i is a root. It can't be. It has to appear together with his partner, the conjugate. Okay, we'll have to stop there because of time.